Did you know that in our country, every hour a patient dies of oral cancer? During 2007, 2008, while the incidence of other cancers was on the decline, the incidence of oral cancer increased by 11% each year. In 2007, over 5,000 men and over 2,000 women died of oral cancer, primarily due to late diagnosis. 40% of the patients diagnosed with oral cancer have non-contributory histories, meaning they don't smoke, use smokeless tobacco, or drink in excess. In times past, men over the age of 45 with contributing histories have been considered the ones that were high risk. Unfortunately, of late there's been a five-fold increase in the incidence of oral cancer among our young people. This is primarily due to the human papilloma virus. In 2008, more physicians diagnosed oral cancer than did dentists. We as dentists should certainly be the front line of defense against oral cancer. 62% of those cases of oral cancer diagnosed were unfortunately stage three or stage four. With early detection, there can be an 80 to 90% survival rate among those with oral cancer. Less than 20% of dentists use any kind of aid to help them in the diagnosis of oral cancer other than visual and tactile. Now, we can do better. The gold standard for oral cancer screening still includes visual inspection and digital palpation of the lips, buccal mucosa, hard and soft palate, the oral pharynx, the floor of the mouth, the tongue, and the gingiva. Now let's look at the oral exam technique. This is a 12-step process that revolves around a mouth map. It will provide you with a printable copy of the two-part mouth map. View 1 shows 8 of the 12 exam sites. View 2 shows the remaining 4 exam sites including the lateral borders of the tongue and the floor of the mouth. This is basically an anterior to posterior exam process in a clockwise pattern. Let's begin the oral examination in area 1 which includes the lower lip, the labial mucosa, and the buccal gingiva of the lower anterior teeth. Area 2 shows the right cheek including the buccal mucosa and the buccal gingiva of the right posterior teeth. The third exam site views the upper lip, including the labial mucosa and the buccal gingiva of the upper anterior teeth. This would be a great area to use the mirrored exam sleeve for better visualization. Exam area four is of the left cheek. It includes the buccal mucosa and the buccal gingiva of the left posterior teeth. Exam site 5 is the dorsal side of the tongue with its papillae, including the circumvallate papillae. In order to better see the dorsal side of the tongue, pull the tongue forward with a piece of gauze and use the mirrored sleeve for better visualization. Area 6 is the left lateral border of the tongue. To visualize it, pull the tongue forward and strongly to the right to see the left lateral border. Area 7 is the right lateral border of the tongue. To see it better, Grasp the tongue with a piece of gauze and pull it strongly to the left. Exam site 8 is the left floor of the mouth, which includes the ventral side of the tongue and the lingual gingiva. This again is one of those areas that is best visualized using the disposable mirrored sleeve. The ninth exam site is the right floor of the mouth. It would include the right ventral side of the tongue and the right lingual gingiva. The tenth area of examination is the hard palate. It would include the incisive papilla, the palatine raffae and rugae, and the lingual gingiva of the upper left and right sides. The eleventh area is the soft palate and the uvula. This would also include the anterior and posterior pillars. The twelfth and final area for examination is the oropharynx, perhaps the most difficult area. For better visualization, pull the tongue forward with a piece of gauze, or use a tongue blade or mirror to depress the posterior portion of the tongue. The 12 step oral exam is a simple yet systematic technique to assure you of a complete and thorough oral cancer screening. To do a complete oral cancer screening with the identified, the doctor will most likely use all three wavelengths of light. Conventional examination of tissue is performed using a highly concentrated white light. Wearing reusable identify filtered eyewear to enhance visual effects and allow transmission of reflected light, the health professional then switches to violet for a second observation. 
The clinician's filtered glasses blocked the violet excitation light and allowed the observation of the tissue's natural fluorescence. Violet light enhances normal tissue's natural fluorescence. However, suspect tissue appears dark because of its loss of fluorescence. When suspect abnormalities are present, the selector is switched to green-amber light, which enhances normal tissue's reflectance properties. So the clinician may directly observe the difference between normal and abnormal tissue vasculature. This can minimize false positives, as the case we are viewing is actually an innocent aphthous ulcer. Now let's look at a case that might be dismissed as an area of denture irritation or lichen planus. However, it happens to be a squamous carcinoma. Under violet light, the area certainly appears dark. But is it a suspicious lesion? To answer that question, we switch to the green-amber light to view the vasculature of the lesion. Studies indicate abnormal tissue has a diffuse vasculature, whereas normal tissue vasculature is clearly defined. This tissue certainly demonstrates a diffuse vasculature and is indicative of abnormal tissue. The combination of all three multispectral wavelengths provides the clinician with more visual information resulting in increased confidence for recommending biopsies. We're about to go into the operatory and do an oral cancer screening. First, I'd like to give you a little bit of history on the patient. Her basic history is non-contributory as far as smoking, smokeless tobacco, or drinking alcohol in excess. She did have breast cancer several years ago, but recently she had noticed some changes in her voice, her ability to swallow, and her hearing. You'll also notice as we go through and do the examination that her tongue deviates slightly to the left when she extends her tongue. Our patient was sent on to the ENT specialist who referred her to Vanderbilt University where they discovered that she had a jugular glomerulus that was two centimeters in diameter on the left side of her head. This restricted the blood and nerve pathways leading to that portion of the tongue that showed up as dark areas with the identified. With early detection, this is a treatable problem, but left undetected, it turns into a very serious problem. Let's go into the operatory now and screen our patient. There is no risk of patient eye injury with any of the three wavelengths. The patient glasses are simply tinted to reduce glare and any standard patient eyewear may be substituted. Because of the special filtration properties of the operator glasses, they cannot be substituted with standard eyewear. Filtered clip-in lenses for use with loops. Now you will be briefly taken through the 12-step exam technique with examples of white and violet light. For video purposes, we'll use the straight sleeve. The best environment for examination is with minimal extraoral light. Let's begin with area 1, the lower lip. Next, let's go to exam area 2, the right cheek. The third examination site is the upper lip. Our fourth site is the left cheek. Area 5 examines the dorsum of the tongue. Exam area 6 is the left lateral border of the tongue. This is where we found our abnormal tissue. We'll come back to this area at the end of the exam. Now let's move to the seventh exam site, the right lateral border of the tongue. We next look at areas 8 and 9, the left and right floor of the mouth. The tenth exam area is the hard palate. The eleventh and twelfth sites of examination are the soft palate and the oral pharynx. This completes our oral exam. As you remember, in area 6, the left lateral border of the tongue, we found evidence of abnormal tissue. Under violet light, these areas appear dark. To further differentiate these lesions, we switch to the green-amber light to examine the vasculature. A malignant lesion would show a diffuse vasculature. These areas demonstrate a smaller, more defined vasculature which is indicative of a non-malignant lesion. You may remember the final diagnosis of these lesions was the beginning of tissue necrosis due to restricted blood flow caused by the jugular glomerulus. You notice when we ask the patient to extend her tongue forward that her tongue deviates to the left side slightly. During the exam, we ask our patient what symptoms and changes she had noticed recently. I was having trouble talking. My voice changed. My singing voice changed. I was having problems swallowing and I noticed a loss of hearing. 
Next, we wanted to know what steps she had taken after we discovered the areas on her tongue. I went to Vanderbilt and they uh, done an MRI and the results of the MRI was that I had a tumor in the middle ear called a glomulus jugular that was blocking the, the nerve and made the hearing loss that I have. And it caused also nerve damage down into the tongue. We asked if the doctor at Vanderbilt told her the spots on her tongue had any connection with the tumor. Dr. Smart says because I have nerve damage that has cut off the circulation to the tongue and that's what's causing the dark spots. Our patient described her treatment options. They're looking currently as to do whether to do radiation or a radical surgery and remove the entire tumor or a sub-radical tumor for removal where they just remove part of it and then radiate what these remained. Early detection does make a difference. Yes, it's better that I caught it. It's only two centimeters currently. It will continue to grow, yes. We certainly wish for our patient the very best results. I thank you. Let's now consider reimbursement for our exam. We currently use code 0431. Most insurance companies will cover a fee of $30 to $60 at approximately 80%, some before and some after the deductible has been applied. Since the code has had low usage to date, some insurance companies may not cover the procedure. If the insurance fails to cover it after the first time you file, always make a second request using documentation and encourage the insurance company to cover it for the benefit of the patient. This patient consent form will allow your patients to understand the cost of the oral cancer screening and that their insurance company may not cover the procedure. The patient on this form can also elect to decline the oral cancer screening if they choose. If there's no insurance involved, we currently charge our patients $30 for the screening. Let me thank you for your purchase through your efforts to perform enhanced oral cancer screenings. Early detection is possible. And if you save the life of just one patient, it's well worth the investment.